David and I were talking this last week or so when he was here. And uh, am, I, am I right? You guys enjoyed last week? Those of you who were here, you enjoyed hearing David speak, right? Good idea, Kevin, having him speak instead of you, right? Yeah. And so I was real pleased with not only him speaking, but the message that he delivered. And boy, it punched, punched me in the gut in several directions, and some of you as well. And uh, I thought I would follow up a bit on what he did. For those of you who were here, and if you weren't here, it should be online before too long, if it's not already. I want you to go back with me in time and realize what he was talking about when he described recovery from failure. We all fail. We all fail. In fact, we fail in two different, three maybe different ways spiritually. One is we fail to reach the mark. We're not quite reaching what God has for us and designed us to be and to do. There is a certain glory that God is and God has and He's made us in His image And when we sin, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of His glory. Falling short is not meeting the mark. That's what sin means. You've missed the mark. And so we fall short by not being what He's, or living out what He's created us to be. We fall short in purposefully rebelling and doing things that He has commanded us not to do. And we fall short in ways of accomplishing what it is he's designed us to accomplish. That is, he wants us to to do good. And failure to do good is missing the mark. Are you with me on that so far? How many of you have fallen today based on the definitions that I've given of failure? Anybody fallen today? Let me ask you again. Some of you are not engaged. Okay, the hand is up really high Fallen a lot? Yeah, we do. And, and your willingness to raise your hand indicates an attitude of heart to a degree. And I don't want to put any pressure on you, but how many of you have failed even today of reaching what God has called you to be or to do or deliberately sinned in some way already today? Anybody? Okay, I thought that if I asked that again and put a little more pressure on you, you'd open up to me. And the thing is, we're scared to do this. David had an idea that at the end of his sermon, he was going to ask all of us to bow our heads and, and say, how many of you have been wrestling with something in particular? Would you raise your hand? And that would be a form of response to a message. We talked about responding to a message. And there's an awkward time at the end of our assemblies, at the end of our of sermon time, there's become kind of an awkward time because we are transitioning from a great awakening period and revivalistic assembly style to a more community and celebratory style, more of like a concert and a worship and praise style. And the invitation doesn't quite fit in our times anymore as much as they used to at one time because it used to be a bring them in, we'll preach to them, and we'll bring them down the aisle. And by the way, if there's some Christians here who have sinned, you can come forward to them, we'll pray for you as well. By the way, we're not getting the sinners to repent and come to Jesus, so those of you who have been sinning because you have been and you know who you are, you need to be up front and we'll pray for you. And so people would come forward during those times. And it was it became, I don't know, a and a concept of if I come forward and people pray for me, then I'm forgiven. But if I don't, I get this burden I'm carrying around with me again. And so there was a system of release, of relief that were, that were built into our assembly. Some of you have no clue what I'm talking about because you don't have that church heritage, that background of coming forward. How many of you can identify with what I'm saying, coming forward and confessing your sins and praying for forgiveness? It was so ingrained to me that when I was eight years old, and I convinced my grandfather was old enough to be baptized, two weeks later, I came forward to confess sin. Eight years old! What kind of an image? What kind of a system? What kind of an understanding of God's forgiveness did I have at eight years old that I felt compelled to go forward to confess that I had sinned? I'd blown it. God wasn't pleased with me anymore, and I I had to do that because, you see, that's how you kept clean. That's my image, I believe, when I was eight, the best I can remember. 
Is that wrong? Well, there's nothing inherently wrong with asking folks to come forward. There's nothing wrong with people coming forward and praying for. In fact, I'll probably do something similar to that at the end of this sermon as well. But I'm not going to be pleading with you to do so in order for you to be forgiven. Because that's not the process of forgiveness. The process of forgiveness for the Christian who has failed is to openly confess to the Lord, and the Lord forgives you. The confession that takes place in the assembly or one-on-one or in a group, that confession is that we would pray for each other that we might be healed. You mean to tell me that there are certain diseases and sicknesses that can occur because of sin? Yeah, I think so. You carry away a burden of rebellion against God and a sin, and you're out of whack with life himself? What do you expect to happen to you physically in the spiritual reality of your own rebellion? You're going to be sick. And James says, pray for one another that you may be healed. That's an emotional healness, a spiritual healness, a physical healness, healness, wellness that we need, healing that we need. And so... Confessing to one another is not for forgiveness. Confessing to one another is that we would pray for each other. So there is a one anotherness to this. But you need to know that when it's you and God and you have sinned against God, you have failed him, you go directly to God through Jesus and confess your sin to him. The word confess is an interesting word. It's homo legeo, and it means to, to agree, to say the same thing. Homo means same. Lego is to say. Homo legeo is to say the same thing. Well, you're just saying the same thing that God has already said about you. He knows you failed. And you're agreeing with him when you confess. Now, when you say to him, Father, I have failed. That's the confession. And the Bible says, when you confess your sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Those of you who are taking notes. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just. He'll forgive your sins. What about those sins that I'm not quite aware of in my life? I have failed, but I didn't realize I failed at the time. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 is a key for you, is an answer. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, If we walk in the light the way He is in the light, the blood of His Son keeps... And we have fellowship with one another. We keep on having fellowship with one another. And the blood of His Son, Jesus, cleanses us from all sins. So as you're walking with Him and you're walking in attempt of being in the light, you cannot perfectly obey God in every way. You're going to fall short of His glory. And so as you step off the line of, his, of the light... The blood of Jesus makes it look like you never sinned at all, and God treats you as if you've never sinned. He's forgiven it already. The blood of Jesus, his son, keeps on cleansing. But when you become aware of your sin, 1 John 1, verse 9 says, confess your sin to him. He's faithful and just to forgive you. It's important for us to maintain a clean and pure walk with God. Why? It keeps our hearts and our lives open for God using us and, and doing with us whatever it is that he wants, us, he wants to accomplish. Sin clogs the pipeline. Clogs the pipeline of blessing. It clogs the pipeline of usage. Sin distorts our view of reality. It turns our eyes more on ourselves and we feel like we'll never be good enough again. Sin is one of Satan's greatest tools. Now hear me carefully. I I, I know you're going to say, well, that's a duh statement. Of course it's a, a, a tool of Satan. Satan tempts. We choose to sin. What happens after that? What happens after the sin? We have an enemy who continues to accuse. And how does he accuse? Internally, you may hear these thoughts. 
and you call yourself a Christian. Who are you fooling anyway? After what you did, you think God's ever going to really forgive you? Do you believe God could use you again after what you've done? Who are you joking? God can never use you like he could if you hadn't sinned, like he did before. He's not going to do it. You are used up. You are spoiled rotten. You are no good anymore. That feeling of failure that becomes the focus then of our attention and we see our sin and we see our weakness and we see our inability and we take our eyes off of His holiness, His forgiveness, and His power. And we start losing sight of each other as well. Because you see, I'm so messed up, I'm the one that needs the help now. And I can't be, I can't, I I am not in a position in my life where I can even see somebody else's needs. Do you see what I'm saying? So when you have a, a period of time where you've been involved in sin, it distorts your vision of reality, your vision of God, your vision of each other, and your vision of yourself. And you lose sight of what he has done, who you are, and whose you are. Galatians chapter 6 was written for us. Because I've just described every person in this room. Some of you just won't admit it. But I've just described every one of us in this room. Some of you have heard me say, a a friend of mine, Marvin Phillips, has said for years, if we were to take off our masks and reveal to each other our failures and our rebellions, we'd laugh at each other for our lack of originality. You are not alone. Realize that everything I'm saying today is not to you, it's to us. There are times when we feel so overwhelmed because, you see, we go through a period of drought because of our failure, and we are so overwhelmed, and we just turn for for some kind of source, sort of like what's happening in Texas right now. They had just gone through a terrible drought. Now look. Right? In fact, uh, I was talking with Chris, and he said that there was a lake, and it was in Dallas, North Texas, somewhere around there. There was a lake that was 23 feet shallow, and now is four feet above the banks. So it is with the shallowness. And and we're hitting a time of drought when we're in sin and rebellion and and we're away from God, we're away from the resources of, of his power and life, and we're dried up. And then when we turn to him and ask for forgiveness, he doesn't give just enough to cover. He floods you with his grace so that you're overflowing with thanksgiving. Drought of sin overflowing with grace and forgiveness. That's the picture I want you to have of the grace of God today. Galatians chapter 6 was written for us, but to understand something about Galatians chapter 6, we've got to understand a little bit about Galatians chapter 5 and what Paul has already communicated. And so begin with verse 16 with me. I say to you, walk by the Spirit and not... And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for those are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, which is the law approach to God, the results, the works of the flesh are what? They're evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity. That's constant anger and dis- and conflict with each other. No, you can't get along. Strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you... As I warned you before, that those who keep on doing, that's what that word is, those who do such things, those who continually do such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things there is no law. You can just keep on doing these and not, not feel guilty about any of them because there's no law against any of them. Just fill it up. Overflow. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and, it, and desires. There was a time in your life where you chose to follow Jesus Christ with all of your heart. You surrendered to him. You gave him your life. You said, Jesus, you're my Lord. I accept from you forgiveness and new life. Thank you, Jesus. You were baptized into Christ. You were raised to walk a new life with him. And you said bye to the old self. You crucified, past tense, your old self, your flesh, and its desires. You said, I'm not going to live this way anymore. But... You find that the works of the flesh continue to creep up, don't you? As do I. But Paul gives us this this insight in verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So keep on walking. Keep that for me, would you? Keep on walking by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. That is, draw your resources from the Spirit of God. When you're faced with the temptation, to this, turn to the Spirit of God to help you overcome. You're having trouble with your thinking patterns. Turn to the Spirit of God to help you clean up your thought life. We need a brainwashing. What do we do? We need a thought washing. We need to stop listening to the enemy saying how bad we are and start listening to, our, to, to the Holy Spirit of God saying how good he is and what he's accomplished for us. We've got to get our eyes off of our own failures and onto his successes and off of our own sin and onto his grace. We get our eyes off of... Now, what does that do for us? Titus chapter 2 says, it's the grace of God that teaches us how to say no to sin. So you want to say no to sin? Don't focus on the sin. Don't focus on the rebellion. Don't focus on your failure as much. Rather, focus on the grace of God. And the grace of God will treat, will teach you, will train you to say no to sin when you're being tempted. So we have done this. We live by the Spirit. Keep on living. Keep on walking by the Spirit. But notice verse 26. What happens as you're walking closer and closer to the Spirit, but you notice other people may not be? Watch. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. There's a time, though, when you notice that someone has been struggling with sin or has been overcome by a particular sin. Maybe the sin is, as David talked about last week, very graphically, pornography. Maybe the sin is greed. Maybe the sin is arrogance. Maybe the sin is gossip. Maybe your particular weakness that I've seen is nobody can get along with you. It's got to be your way or nobody, no way. Maybe the sin that you notice in somebody else is, um, my mind's going blank, drunkenness. Okay. When you see somebody in sin, what do you do? How do you help? Verse 1 of chapter 6. Brothers, if anyone is, this translation says, caught in any transgression. The picture is that you were walking along and you were ensnared. You're trapped. You weren't expecting it. This wasn't a planned out thing. If any one of you is like this, If anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore the one who is caught. Not talk about, not look down upon, not be conceited, not say, I don't understand why that person can't get her life together or his life together. After all the things that have gone on, after all we've done for him, how can he, don't be looking at him like that, but rather restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Be tempted how? 
Well, not just tempted in the same temptation that the person has overcome, but be tempted to, to take the chapter 5 and verse 26 attitude of conceit and envy, provoking. Rather be gentle. So somebody's trapped in a sin. What do you do? Matthew chapter 18 says, Jesus told us these instructions. Go to the person individually. Talk to the person privately. Perhaps she or he will repent. That is, change the mind that will change the lifestyle. Go to the person in love. This passage says gently, not in a condemning and judgmental fashion, but rather one like how my father-in-law approached me one time. Kevin, if you saw something in my life that I needed to change, would you love me enough to come and talk to me? Yeah, sure, Steve, I'd be happy to. Could I have that privilege with you? What a setup. (laughs) And it works. What am I going to say? No, you can't. I don't want you to love me that much. No, and, and it, see, and it describes, it lays as the foundational attitude toward me. He loves me. He wants me to do better. It's not he's condemning me and he's caught me doing something wrong. He said, let me share with you what I've noticed. What a loving, gentle approach. And I recommend that or something like that with a friend who maybe you have noticed or then how do I even get in this conversation with someone to address this issue that is the, it's the elephant in the living room? How do I do that? So this passage may be helpful with a spirit of gentleness. Bear, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You go in with the attitude of, I want to help you. And I know you're under a lot of stress and under a lot of pressure, and I'm not going to give you... Um, excuses to take the responsibility off of you. These are decisions that you've made. You're wrong in making them, but I'm here to help and not to condemn. Does this make sense so far? I believe that as you do that, you've got your arm around each other's shoulders, you can now encourage. By the way, there might be a time for you to open up and confess as well. People are more likely to open up with you when you yourself are more open about your own failures. So that spirit of gentleness is coming to someone not as a position of, I have it all together, but rather a position of equality and we're both failures and we're at the foot of cr- at the cross, which makes everyone equal. We're all equal. The cross is the leveler. So if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Come in as a helper, as an encourager, alongside of. So Jesus said, go to the person privately. Paul says, go with this kind of an attitude. What happens if the person doesn't listen to you? What happens if she turns her her head against you and turns her back to you? What happens if he says, I really don't care. Yeah, I did that, and I would do it again if I could. Then you bring witnesses. Or if the person denies it, then what do you do? Wasn't me. I didn't do it. Or takes puts responsibility on other things people or circumstances in life instead of taking responsibility for herself and for himself. Then what do you do? You bring a witness. And then mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter of is established. That's what the law says, and those are good guidance, words of guidance for us. So you go in one-on-one. If the person refuses to change, you come with some witnesses. Do you do so condemningly? You're going to beat him over the head? No, you do it gently. Do it kindly. You do it as one who wants to help carry the burden. You want to restore, not cut off. The idea is not to cut off the fellowship. The idea is to restore the fellowship. That the fellowship with the Lord is first and primary. The fellowship with the body is a result of that. And so you go to the person individually. What happens, though, when the person says, I'm not going to do anything about it? Then you bring it before the whole congregation, Jesus says, the whole assembly, and you cut the person off and treat him. In Jesus' day, you treat him as a tax collector, as a heathen. 
Well, the tax collectors were looked down upon. The tax collectors were, there was no fellowship with the tax collector, right? The IRS agent comes to our assembly, they're sitting in the back, another room. That's, that was how they viewed them then. And that's how you are to treat the person until, and this is the caveat, until he or she repents. You cut off the fellowship. What if the person's already cut off the fellowship from you? Then what do you do? Well, then you have a formality that is meaningless. That is, you can't disfellowship someone who's disfellowshipped you. person cuts off already. All you're doing is declaring it publicly, but the to go to my notes, the person refuses to change, and you let the individual know. But I don't think there necessar- that necessarily means needs to be a public statement, but certainly a public dealing. When done in that way, I'm just combining Matthew chapter 18 with Galatians 6, and I don't want to violate the context of both of these passages because they're both dealing with when somebody has sinned, how do you approach them? And this tells the attitude of the individual of restoring in gentleness and as a helper who will carry the burden with someone, and it's going to take time. The one thing I believe we, we have to do is that when there are individuals who are caught up in sin, that they understand, number one, we're along with them. We have been caught in sin in ourselves. We still struggle with the weaknesses of our flesh. Number two, that our, our goal is to have reconciliation. And we want that person to know we love him or her with the love of the Lord. We will not let go. God is tenacious. He runs after He seeks the lost. It's the shepherd looking for the lost sheep. And so it is he uses us to to do that. I, I address these things because I believe that on the one hand, you and I are totally responsible for our walk with Jesus. We have an individual responsibility. Would you agree with me there? As a part of the body of Christ, I'm responsible to reach and help and encourage each individual who's a, who is a part of the body of Christ. I'm responsible for. I will help carry the burden of. Does that, do you agree with that as well? Okay. So there is the individual walk with him that we want to strengthen and encourage and present each person mature in Christ. And there is also each of us are connected to each other because of the blood of Jesus and the Spirit of God. There is a one anotherness to this. So there's two things that I want to say in conclusion. Number one is don't think that you're isolated in your sin and no one has ever done what you've done. No one's ever gone through what you've gone through. No one's ever faced what you faced. No one's ever failed like you failed. And God can't use you again. Don't think that. There was a time in my life where I had failed so much, and I had recollected in my mind so many of the failures over years of, of rebellion against God and periodically, and I, thought, I just keep rehearsing them over and over and over in my mind. I can remember a conversation with a man who's most influential on me spiritually, I said, Paul, I feel so so much like a failure. How can God use me now? And he said, Kev, he doesn't have a choice. All he has are failures. And so it is. I don't want you to be caught up in that mindset. But nor do I want you to be caught up in the mindset of that we're not connected to each other and we don't have a responsibility to each other because we do. The number one responsibility we have for each other is to help each other stay connected to and grow in the Lord. 
The number one, it is not to have a good time together. It is not to laugh and, and just enjoy each other's company. The number one responsibility is to do whatever we have to do in order to help each individual stay true to the Lord and grow up in the Lord and that we reach the community with the message of Jesus. The number one responsibility is the relationship with Jesus. That's what brought us together to begin with. It's what communion was all about. As, as, as Benjamin was talking about, it's, it's what holds us together is the relationship with Jesus. And without that is the primary focal point of our reason for doing things together. Why do we celebrate the graduates? To help them keep their eyes on Jesus as they continue their walk. Why is it that we even have a potluck meal? It's to have fellowship with each other. Why? So we can encourage each other in our walk with Jesus. Why do we meet each other in our homes, in small group, in life groups? It's to encourage each other, to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and to stay Tightly bound to him. That is it. So we're going to sing, here we are, but strain pilgrims. Yeah, but you're not walking alone. You're not walking alone. You don't need to be carrying a burden alone. We can help. We can help. There are other people who have walked your walk. They've gone through some of the difficulties that you're facing yourself. They've gone through the same failures and recovery that you have. Don't let your sin identify you. Make it your relationship with Jesus that identifies you. It is not your failure that defines who you are. That's not your story. Your story is that Jesus rescued, that he forgave, Your story is, he is your life. Here we are, but straying pilgrims. We're going to keep on looking for the coming of the Lord and keep encouraging each other to walk closely with him. Let's all stand and sing.